Welcome to another session of our class on how to perform the prayer the correct way, the way that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to perform it. And we've already spoken about how important it is, you know, to make sure that we do the things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged us to do that would help to open and strengthen our connection uh, with Allah. We talked about how there are some things that we can do before the prayer. Who can remind us, what are some of the things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to do before the prayer that can help to strength, strengthen our kushua? Who can tell us? Wait a minute. I'm trying to put the, um, on Facebook. Anyone, what are some things that the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to do before the prayer that will help to strengthen, strengthen our kushua? Come on, everybody should know that. Anyone? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Okay, one of the way you can is like doing will do properly, like saying Bismillah and saying Bismillah for Vizu and do, making dua after Vizu, like saying Ashhadu Allah Ilaha Illallah. After Vizu is done, that's the one way we can do it. Exactly. And, <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah. And the place should be clean, and the clothes should be clean. Exactly, guys, to perform the sunans of the wudu, saying bismillah before we make wudu, reciting the shahada afterwards, also making sure that our clothing is clean, our breath is clean, that the area in which we're going to per perform the prayers are clean and free, excuse me, free of distraction. These things will help to, de to, to develop our kushua. And we talked about how there are also things we can do during the prayer. What are some of the things we discussed already that if we do them while we're praying, they will help to keep our uh, uh, keep us focused? Who can answer that? We can move during Tashahud. Um, we can move our index finger and stare at it. We can also, if we're standing and reading the Quran, ponder on the Quran or look at where your head will go um, so that you can keep up with your kashur, inshallah. Exactly, mashallah. Doing the sunan actions of the prayer will help to strengthen our kushua. And like she said, pondering the Quran as you read it will help to strengthen uh, uh, the kushua. And this is why uh, Dr. Asim, he is so strict on uh, making us read the Quran at a slow measured pace, pace you know, so that you can pronounce the, everything correctly. And, and, and also the way you pronounce the Quran show, uh, shows uh, how you pray. If you rush through the Quran, you're going to rush through your prayers. So these are just some of the things that we talked about. And also yesterday, let me put the quiz up. We talked about more things we can do uh, uh, during the prayer to help with our uh, kushua. Let's look at the questions from yesterday. Let's look at question one, number one. Sister Sabrine. Sister Sabrine, why is it so important to recite El Fatiha slowly and with dignity, Sabrine? Take your time. Mm -hmm. 
sister um girl my mind is going sister dahire sister dahire why is it so important uh uh to recite el fatiha slowly and with dignity sister dahire Um, um, so I can ponder the meaning. Okay. One of the reasons why is to ponder the meaning and why else? Anyone else? Why is it so important? Um, Go ahead. Cause, um, because you're talking with Allah and you, and you, and you want to be humble um, in humility with Allah. Exactly. Also the fact he had. This is a conversation between you and Allah. So you want to humble yourself before Allah. Good job. Anyone else? I would say yeah. one thing is that um, when you're um, reciting the Fatiha, not only are you um, like what the brother, the little boy said, I would also say that it's like, you know, a personal dua you're making, like asking Allah to keep you on the straight path. So that's what I would say, like a personal dua, you know. Yes, it's a personal supplication. Good job. Any other reasons why it's important? And because the Fatiha is, a, the, the Salah is a Fatiha. If you did not recite Fatiha properly and uh, um, ponder the meaning of it, your uh, your Salah will be messed up. Exactly. So the Salah is a Fatiha. The, yes, the Fatiha, Fatiha is a pillar. Good job. You guys come up with great answers. What's another reason why? Why it's important to recite the al Fatiha slowly. Anyone else? Okay, because also remember, Allah answers us. It's a conversation to the point where as every time we Person. recite a, a, a sentence, Allah answers us. So you want to recite it with calm, recite it with dignity, so as Allah can uh, answer us back. Okay, so mashallah, and you guys have to excuse me. I know I look like I'm about to fall out. I didn't get any sleep last night. SubhanAllah, and it's just now hitting me. Okay, let's look at question number two. Does a sutra play a role in kushua? And if so, what role does it play? Dr. Jamali talked about that today. Who can remember? Mm -hmm. Yes, it plays a role in it because if you have a sutra, then it protects you from your, you know, your field of vision. It will protect you from anything that's like distracting you. And it's like, and it's just really um, better just to have that because it's sometimes, you know, you have like children that will just try to like be standing in front of you and all that. But then when you have that sutra there, you know, it tells them to not pass it. Exactly. It's another means of strengthening your kushua because it, like Dr. Jamali said, it's a suna that we are, that has become abandoned. Another one of the sunans that are, that's become abandoned. You know, we're not praying with a sutra. The sutra helps to keep distractions away. The sutra helps to keep shaitan away. If we would pray with a sutra, I'm telling you, you will be able to focus and concentrate more on what you're saying uh, to a law with up to a law. Okay, good job. Okay, let's look at the next question. The prophets, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all performed their prayers with their hands how? With their left hand over their right hand in the middle of their chest. Exactly. And just like, you know, that hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about how the fitra, you know, all the prophets wore a beard. You know, that's why you men that shave your beard, shame on you shady men. Shady is a lady in a mustache. Shady is a man without one. Okay. Every prophet had a beard. Every prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had their, uh, prayed the same way with their hands, uh, the way the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us and across their chest. Okay, there are certain things from the fitra. Every prophet was circumcised. Every prophet, you know, uh, removed their pubic hair. Okay, 
every prophet passed through the Euphrates and, and, and the, uh, the Euphrates River. That's a, and the Nile, the Nile and the Euphrates, every prophet passed through it. There are certain things that's from the, the, from the Fitra, okay? And we do these things too, you know, because they help with our kushua and when it comes to praying and worshiping Allah. Let's look at the next question. True or false, the eyes should be staring at whatever is in front of you when you are praying. True or false? False. False. Um, it's because you should look where the spot of the sujood. It was reported from Aisha that the Prophet used to pray with the head tilted forward and gaze his Lord looking at the ground. Exactly. Mashallah. Our uh gay our <laughs> boy, I'm tired. Our eyes should be on that spot on the floor where our head will will hit when we prostrate. Does everybody understand that? Your eyes should be looking there. Okay, the only time we would move our eyes away from that spot is when, guys? When we in Shadud. No, Sajud, you, you're hitting that spot. When? Yeah. When you're moving your finger, you look at your exactly. finger. Exactly. The only time you move your eyes away from that spot is when you are reciting Natasha Hood and you're moving your finger. Because where do your eyes go then? To your finger. Exactly. Your eyes go to your finger when you're reciting El Tasha Hood. Okay? <laughs> well, before then or any other time, your eyes are made on the spot on the floor where your head will be in Sajud. Good job. And uh, uh, why do the Muslims, last question, why do Muslims move their finger when reciting el ta the Tashahu? We move our because finger to all. Um, it pushes. Uh, go ahead, Sabrina. <clears throat> it pushes the jinn back. Mashallah pushes the jinn back. And what else? Go ahead, Lucy. And go ahead. It's stepping the, the higher barn from the shaitan, so it, uh, it keeps the shaitan away as well. Exactly. It's like an iron bar. And that's what the prophet, when he said the Muslims knew, if they knew the importance, you know, of moving that finger up and down, they would do it because it becomes like an iron bar that keeps you from being distracted. You don't have to worry about, I got to go to the website and make sure I do the PowerPoint. Oh, I got to hurry up and get through and record Dr. Jamali. Oh, oh, don't forget to pick Jayla up. Oh, 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 go grocery shopping. Oh, oh, cat need, I need cat litter. Oh, 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 no. Move that finger and all that distraction, you know, will disappear. So that's why we move that finger up and down when we're praying. Okay, mashallah. Okay, any questions about any of those answers? Any questions about any of those answers? Okay, let's put the PowerPoint up on the screen for today because we're going to speak a little bit more about the Kushua. Oh, what happened here? Huh. Okay, today we're going to speak about uh, uh, the importance of seeking refuge from the shaitan when we are praying, because again, it's easy to become distracted. And again, your personal jinn never sleeps. He's gonna do everything in his power to try to um, weaken your prayer. So there are certain things that our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us to say or do that will help within this. And again, a lot of people will come and say, dear Sister Layla, why is it that when we go to pray, we start having these thoughts, insinuating thoughts about what we need to do? Well, it comes from your jinn. His job is to try to confuse you. It's known in Arabic as West West, West West. This is a problem that everyone encounters who turns to Allah in remembrance and other kinds of worship. So we have to learn to be firm and patient and to continue to worship Allah and not give in to those thoughts that we get. 
as the law says in the interpretation of the meaning, ever feeble indeed is the plot of shaitan. And I want the sisters here to look at this picture. I use this picture today because somebody was asking about a prayer garment for women. This is an example of a, of a praying garment for women. It's just a skirt and you have the kimar over it that we just slip the skirt on and throw the kimar, put your head through the kimar and you're covered to pray. You can buy these anywhere and most Islamic stores, even Islamic bookstores sell them and they don't cost much. Okay, but that's a prayer garment that one of the sisters was asking me about. So each and every one of us suffer with uh, bad thoughts when we're praying. And again, it comes from our personal gen. He wants to distract you. He wants to confuse you. And this is why one of the companions said the Jews and Christians, they say that they don't suffer with the problem of West West. And one of the companions said they are speaking the truth. For what would the shaitan want with a house that is already in ruins? And then this is true. You know, don't compare yourself to a Kafir. Christians are Kafirs, Jews are Kafirs. They don't suffer with that. They already Kafirs. Shaitan has already defeated them. Shaitan has already won the battle against them. They're not Muslim. So of course they don't have to worry about distractions because they were boasting and bragging about how, oh, when we pray, when we worship our Lord, we don't get distracted. Yeah, of course not. He already won. You ain't praying to Allah, you praying to Jesus. You praying to Israel. You praying to something else. So of course you don't suffer with whiz, whiz, whiz. we do. Because again, Shaitan's a job is to try to take us to the hellfire. He already got them. If he didn't have them, they'd be Muslim. They're not Muslim. Okay. Also, we have to understand that that personal jinn is jealous of you. Because every time we stand before Allah to worship him, it's a reminder as to what his master Iblis didn't do. And it's also a reminder to him as to what he won't do. And I want you guys to understand that every one of us has a jinn assigned to us and it is not a good jinn. It's an evil jinn. <laughs> Allah put that jinn there on purpose. Their job is to seduce you seduce you to disobey a law and go to hell that jinn is already a companion of the hellfire he wants to make you be his accompanying companion so it ain't about converting no jinn first of all you can't convert a jinn anyway because they're part of the unseen world okay secondly that jinn was is not convertible like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Aisha, every son of Adam has a jinn assigned to him. And that jinn's job is to seduce you to go to hell. Except for me, I am a prophet. Allah has given the prophets, you know, uh, control over their jinn. Okay, but we're not prophets. We're not prophets. There will be no more prophets of Allah or messengers of Allah after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We may be messengers amongst mankind, but we are not messengers of Allah. I am a, you know, I am a messenger here amongst mankind. That's what a daya means in English. A daya is a messenger, a person that conveys the message of the truth. But I am not a prophet. I am not a messenger of Allah. I'm just a peasant human being that's trying to call you back to what the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent here with okay so that jinn is not convertible it's evil and he never sleeps he's going to do everything in his power to take you down with him so he tries to stop you from praying he tries to stop you from fasting. We had a sister join here yesterday 
and she was speaking about how um, uh, she can't fast during Ramadan. Well, it's because her faith is weak. She can fast, but she chooses not to because she doesn't have the, the medicine needed to defeat her gin, which is building her belief in Allah and her fear of his punishment. That's what your jinn wants you to do, to not fast, to not pray. As Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, he will make assaults on you with his cavalry and his infantry. That's what Iblis will do. He will attack you. And he will continue to do this every time you get ready to pray. And every time you do pray until you begin to think of the prayer as being nothing. Just like that sister was saying, she doesn't think of fasting as being much. She thinks it's just hard, too hard for her when it's not. It's not because nobody eats from sunrise to sunset anyway. Nobody sits there and continuously stuffs his or her face uh, 24 hours a day. Subhana Allah, but your personal jinn wants to make you think, you know, that you can't fast, think that you can't pray. So when you do go to pray, he's going to come to you and start putting thoughts in your head. But then he doesn't stop. If you ignore your jinn, he will come to you then when he sees that putting thoughts in your brain's not working. He's gonna then try to distract you, distract you with the children, distract you with things that's going on around you. He's gonna try to make you think that maybe you forgot to do something. Oh, where did I put my keys? Oh, I gotta remember to do this. You know, so that personal gym will continue to bother you while you're praying. And this is something that we all go through as human beings. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us what to do to, to, to defeat our personal jinn when he comes putting those bad thoughts and distractions in our head. For example, one of the companions said that he went to the Prophet and said, oh, messenger of Allah, the shaitan interrupts me when I pray and I get confused when I'm reciting. The prophet said, that's a jinn whose name is Kanzib. If you sense his presence, seek refuge with the law from him and blow air over your left shoulder three times. This companion said he did that and Allah took him away. So that's what the prophet taught us to do. You're standing up praying, Allahu Akbar. You start reciting Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah, here I build alamin. Then all of a sudden, oh, I gotta go to the store. Oh, rock my nirahim. Hurry up, Layla. Maliki Omadin. The prophet said, say, Audu Balahi. Audu Balahi, men of Shaitan Nirajim, and blow air <sighs> like that over your left shoulder three times. That'll knock that jinn away. That'll knock him away. And I'm gonna tell you something about the jinn. They may be stronger than us physically but they are weaker than us mentally. Whenever the jinn hears the name Allah, they run away. If you say Allah, they run away. Allah, they run away. So when you say, A'udhu Billahi min shaitan nirajim, which is I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan, he will run back into his place in your heart and leave you alone but he comes back. He'll keep coming back. But this is why the prophet said, blow air to knock him away from whispering to you. And that, and Audu Balahi to knock him back to where he belongs. Also, the prophet said, when any of you gets up to pray, the shaitan will come and try to confuse you. He'll get you to mix up your prayer and put doubts in your mind so that you don't know how many rakats you prayed. If any of you experiences this, then do two prostrations while sitting. And we talked about this. This is the prayer of forgetfulness. Say, for example, you don't got distracted. You don't know if you on rakat number three or rakat number four. Well, you take the guess 
And after you recite that final Tashahud, do two prostrations of Saju and then give salams, and that'll make up for that. So again, the prophet taught us how to handle ourselves in this. Another hadith, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if any of you is praying and feels some movement in your stomach, and you don't know if you pass gas or not, you should not, I repeat, you should not, I repeat, you should not end your prayer unless you hear a sound or smell an odor. Because again, this is the doubt. This is the West West that our personal gen tries to put in our mind. He wants to make you think that you pass gas. But no, doubt comes from shaitan. If you don't smell it, that nasty smell, or if you don't hear that sound, then you keep on praying. You keep it moving. And when you get through, go to the bathroom and make your movement. Okay. You know, so here you can see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us how to defeat the shayateen and how to defeat our personal jinn when he's trying to distract us during the prayer. We have a hadith whereas Ibn Abbas said that the Prophet was asked about a man who thought he had broken his uh, wudu when he had not. The prophet said, the shaitan may come to any of you when you are praying and open your buttocks and make you think that you've broken your wudu when in fact you have not. So if this happens to any of you, do not end your prayer unless you hear the sound of it with your ears or smell the odor of it with your nose. Because again, that personal gen is traveling all through your body. Shaitan runs through a, a human being like blood runs through our veins. So he's traveling all through our body, making your stomach grumble here, making your buttocks spread there. Oh, 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 I pass gas. Unless you hear it or unless you smell it, you keep it moving. Don't fall for it. These are all the tricks that Shaitan uses with us. And so now what I want to do is look at the role models that we're supposed to have as Muslims. Let's look at our companions, the companions of the prophet and see how they were able to keep their kushur during the prayer. And let's start with Mujahid. Mujahid said when one of them would stand in prayer, he would be too fearful of Allah to allow his eyes to look at anything else or to turn side to side or to fiddle around with uh, uh, pebbles. And this is something that we're lacking today as Muslims. We have no fear of Allah. You know, like Ibn Abbas said, you know, we companions, we companions, you know, whenever we committed a sin, you know, we looked at it as being something great, but you guys commit sins today and you just brush it away like it's nothing. Subhana Allah. Well, the companions, they had fear of Allah. And that fear of Allah is what kept them from being so uh, uh, quick to look around and, and lose reward of their prayers. And one example of this was Ibn al-Zubair. When he would stand up to pray, he would be like a stick. He would, he would be immov immobile with his kushur. In fact, he was once prostrating, making Salat when a catapult was launched at him when Mecca was being attacked. And part of his garment was torn away from the blast while he was praying. But guess what? He didn't even feel it. He didn't even hear it. He didn't even raise his head. Here they were at war. Mecca was being attacked. And a catapult came flying through the mosque. He didn't even hear it, feel it. He kept on with his prayer. That's how strong and great his kushua, you know, was. SubhanAllah. Also, Muslima Ibn Bashar was another example. He was praying in the mosque when part of it collapsed. And the people got up and ran out the mosque screaming and hollering, but he re remained praying and didn't even notice it. 
You know, here the mosque was being uh, co collapsed and falling down. He didn't even know it. He kept on with his prayer. Then we have another example with Ali. When the time for prayer would come, Ali would be visibly shaken. The color of his face would change. And they would say, what's wrong with you? And he said, by Allah, there has come the time of the trust which Allah offered to the heavens and the earth and the mountains. But they declined it. They were afraid of it, but we humans took it on. In other words, he knew, you know, the amina, the trust, you know, between uh, uh, the prayer and Allah. Does everybody understand that? So we have to, you know, look at these companions and how they handle uh, uh, the prayer and learn from them. Look at Saad ibn Mu'ad. He said, I have three qualities which I wish I could keep all the time. Then I would really be something great. And those three qualities is number one, when I am praying, I don't think about anything except the prayer that I'm making. Number two, if I hear any hadith from the prophet, I never question it. I never doubt if it's authentic. And number three, when I attend a funeral, I don't think about anything except what the Janaza says and what it is, it is, is said to it. Supana Allah. You know, again, I tell you guys, think about death. When we go to pray, imagine that this is the last prayer that you will make on earth. Imagine that this is your farewell to the world. And think about death, how death can come at any moment. You know, if we did that, this would help us in our kushur uh, when we pray. So thus, I want you guys to understand it's human for each and every one of us to experience the attacks of shaitan when we are praying. But again, our prophet told us how to knock him away. Number one, when he comes to you, putting thoughts into your mind, trying to distract you, trying to confuse you while you're praying, say, a'udhu balahi mena shaitan regime and blow over your left shoulder three times. And again, as if he's trying to get you to doubt as to whether you broke your prayer or not, you ignore him. Unless you hear something, unless you smell something, you keep on praying. So again, it's all about seeking refuge with Allah. It's all about a'udhu balahi mina shaitan rajim. Doing this will help to strengthen our prayer. So we're going to stop right here for today. Uh, if you guys have any questions, inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Supana kala huma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Any questions or comments?